When my parents told me they were moving to the middle of nowhere, I'll admit I was concerned. Both of them had been able to retire in their late 50s, so while they weren't super old, I was still nervous about them being so far away from civilization. What if they got hurt? If my dad fell off a ladder, or if mom slipped and hit her head on a rock? Or hell, what if one of them got bitten by a rattlesnake or something? Could an ambulance get to them in time if something bad happened? I was so preoccupied with those thoughts, I never considered the actual dangers. My parents bought our old house when I was a baby, and lived there until my younger brother and I had both finished college. It was a cute house in a nice neighborhood, but it was small, and it always felt a little cramped. Not enough space for all of us, and constantly under scrutiny of the neighbors. My dad always hated having neighbors, and claimed that his dream was to be able to just live out in the woods where no one would bother him. And while I don't think my mom cared so much about living close to other people, she did always complain about being able to hear road noise from the nearby highway. So when the opportunity came for them to buy land out in the Texas Hill Country, they sprang on it. 50 acres of rural, wooded property, 6 miles down a dirt road and 30 minutes away from the closest town that was so small it basically consisted of a Walmart and a few gas stations. The land they were buying was, well, land. There wasn't anything built on it, and they'd basically be starting their homestead from scratch. When they first bought the property, they spent a few weekends out there in a tent. Then they bought a camper, then traded it in and bought a bigger camper, and eventually even had a 6,000-foot shop built to use as a storage building and garage for my dad's various projects. And there were a lot of projects. Constructing a carport, building a deck around the camper, clearing trees and brush to make room for further developments. I suppose this was part of the appeal I just didn't understand. My parents looked at this property and saw potential. Saw a project. All I saw was dirt and trees. Scenic, pretty dirt and trees, but not the type of thing I wanted for myself. Anyway, after selling the old house, they ended up using the camper and part of the shop as their living space. They had plans to eventually build a house out there, and maybe even have a few tiny houses built as cabins for any family or friends that ever came to visit. But it would be a few years before those plans materialized, and for the time being, they were still living out of a camper and had to do their business in a wooden outhouse roughly the size of a porta potty While I might not have understood the appeal, they both seemed really happy, and I was glad they were enjoying their retirement. Since my brother and I lived about an hour and a half away from my parents' property, we didn't visit very often. We would occasionally go out there for the weekend, and once they sold the house, we would do Christmas and Thanksgiving holidays there, but overall our time at the ranch was limited. And when we did go up to visit, I often found myself getting bored pretty quickly. While being away from the hustle and bustle was relaxing, it was almost too relaxing, too quiet. I'd sit on the deck and look at nature, walk around and look at nature, sit inside and look out the window at the nature, but there wasn't really much to do. In addition to that, there was always something a little scary about being out there. My parents had other people living nearby, but they weren't so close that they'd be able to come running if they heard screams, and my parents only had cell service inside the camper. Aside from that, they were off the grid and cut off from other people. Again, while that made my dad happy, I was always paranoid about that kind of thing. What if some weirdo wandered onto the property with a shotgun? I hadn't seen that many horror movies in my life, but it doesn't take much to conjure up that kind of mental image, especially considering that their property didn't have a fence. Call me a city girl if you want, but there was something unnerving about having nothing to separate you from the rest of nature. That at any moment some stranger or wild animal might wander onto the property and get up in your business. Plus, being alone out there at night always brought back memories of watching scary movies and playing horror games like Slender with my friends in college. And when walking to the outhouse at night, I was always a little afraid of catching a humanoid silhouette in the beam of my flashlight. I like to think that horror doesn't affect me that much, but it's hard not to think about that stuff when you're out there. 
It's just so big, and it feels endless, especially in the dark. So much could be out there in the gaps between our homes and the unknown. What's out there, hiding in the dark just beyond what our eyes can see, watching us from just past where our lights can reach? They say we've only explored a small percentage of the world's oceans, that there could be any number of weird things we've never seen before hiding in the depths. I think that the same thing could be said about the wilderness. Sometimes things can do a good job of not being found. And also, that random man with a shotgun thing wasn't far out of the realm of possibility, either. Apparently, a few of the other properties near my parents' ranch were unfenced stretches of land that were used as hunting grounds by the owners and their friends. And since there wasn't a fence, sometimes the property lines were vague. My dad told me stories about how, during hunting season, he'd heard gunshots pretty close by when hunters mistakenly wandered over their property line. They were planning on having a fence installed eventually, but it was expensive, and would take some time considering how large the perimeter was. Another reason my parents needed a fence was for animals. Not to keep wild animals out, necessarily, but more to keep their own animals in. My parents had plans for eventually getting a handful of chickens, cows, and maybe some goats or something. But at the time of this story, they only had two pets. A pair of galumphing, flabby basset hounds named George and Gracie. The pair were littermates. Orange and white, short-legged tanks with droopy ears and sagging skin, each weighing approximately 70 pounds and possessing little intelligence to speak of. They weren't smart, but... They were very loving, and pretty cute, if you didn't mind the drool. Basset hounds are scent hounds, and while my parents were initially worried they'd run away and get lost in the brush chasing hogs or squirrels, the two ended up adjusting very well to ranch life. Eventually, they even started going on unsupervised walks together. They somehow instinctively knew not to wander too far from my parents' camper, and would disappear into the brush for an hour or so each morning to go patrol the property, and just came back when they got hungry. There were a few times when they did run off after something in the woods, chasing whatever it was so far into the brush that my parents had to go after them. But they always came back in the end. It's just, sometimes they didn't come back empty-handed. One weekend in the fall, my brother and I went up to visit my parents for a short weekend trip. My parents had just recently sold the old house in Austin and were starting work on my mom's future chicken coop. They were in the process of clearing land for it near the shop, and part of the weekend was spent teaching my brother and I how to use the large excavating equipment they'd recently rented to pull up the scraggly cedar trees that littered the property. The dogs had gone off on their morning walk about some time ago, but my parents didn't seem concerned. This was something they did every morning, and they'd be back by lunch. And sure enough, around an hour after I noticed they were gone, I heard the telltale sounds of their collar tags jingling, and there they were trotting towards the camper and looking very proud of themselves. Not long after that, we stopped working to take a lunch break and made our way over to the camper. And that's when I saw it. Jesus Christ, what is that? I exclaimed, remarking on the gnarled object sitting near the stairs of the camper deck. The thing was about a foot in length, slightly wider at the ends and more tapered in the middle. The whole thing was covered in a layer of short, wiry hair, but it had obviously been chewed on by the dogs and was coated in saliva. A few flies buzzed around it. Ah, Georgie found another one, my dad said, nonchalantly peering over my shoulder as he passed me from behind. Another what? I asked, disgusted. Trotter. He's been finding a lot of those recently. A what? A trotter. Look at it he said, pointing to the hairy, chewed stick. Sure enough, as I looked closer, I noticed the white of bone sticking out at one end, and on the other, two thin black nubs shaped like curved teardrops. A hoof. It's, uh... Leg. Deer leg. Dad finished. I told you how there's a couple of neighbors who go hunting around here? Well, when they shoot a deer, they usually carve it on sight and get rid of the non-edible bits before bringing it back makes it easier to carry. And they just leave the legs behind? I asked. Not much use in taking them. Hardly any meat on them. Coyotes like them, though. 
And basset hounds, apparently, I said, wrinkling my nose at the chewed leg. Yeah, he brings back the ones he finds, gnaws on them for a few days. It'll be gone before too long, though. Ew, he's not going to heat the whole damn thing, is he? No, you'll see, he assured me. Something will sniff it out and steal it before too long. We aren't sure exactly what's been taking them. We don't have any game cameras set up this close to the camper, or we'd be setting it off constantly. But something likes to steal the legs Georgie brings back after he's done with them. Probably a fox or a coyote. You're not worried about whatever it is attacking the dogs? I asked, raising an eyebrow. The dogs stay locked up at night, he shrugged. As long as it's gone by morning, it's not a problem. And with that, he walked up onto the steps of the deck and into the camper, the screen door shutting behind him. As if he knew I'd been talking about him, Georgie waddled over from the other side of the deck and down the stairs towards me, snuffling against my jeans for a moment and leaving a trail of drool behind as he plopped down and resumed gnawing on the discarded deer leg. You are disgusting, I told him, but he ignored me and continued chewing on his new toy. After lunch, we worked for a few hours longer, digging up trees and carrying them into the fire pit before the sun started to set and we made our way inside. My parents put a movie on the TV mounted to the wall of the camper, some action movie I wasn't terribly invested in. My brother was curled up with Gracie on the pull-out guest couch reading a book, and around the midway point, I got tired of the movie and decided I wanted to draw. I always carried a sketchbook with me of some kind, mostly to keep my hands busy during slow points in the day. But as I shuffled through my overnight bag, I realized my sketchbook wasn't there. Then I recalled that I had been using it back in the shop earlier that day and sighed as I grabbed my boots. Going somewhere? Mom asked. Left my sketchbook in the shop, I replied. Take the flashlight with you, she said, handing me a sturdy black mag light she kept on a shelf by the door. And try to make some noise as you're walking. We've seen some hogs out there at night, and they can be aggressive if you sneak up on them. Got it, I said, flicking on the flashlight and stepping outside. The days were growing shorter and shorter as the fall set in, and though it was only around 8.30, it was already pitch dark outside. I had a little bit of light from the camper's porch light, and a faint wash of silver shining down from the moon up above, but it wasn't enough to really see by, and I still made sure to keep the flashlight pointed down to watch my step. There were lots of cacti growing around the path between the camper and the shop, and the last thing I needed was to be pulling cactus spines out of my leg all night. The shop wasn't far from the camper, only about a hundred feet or so past the outhouse, a covered carport, and the fire pit my parents had made to burn the brush they collected. Most of the trees had been cleared out of the area between the two structures, except for a few scraggly little juniper trees. As I walked, I remembered what my mom had suggested, and started humming a dumb little song just to be making some kind of noise. There had better not be any pigs out here. I would prefer not to get mauled tonight, just minding my own business. To my right, a twig snap, followed by a shuffle. I quickly swung my flashlight over to the source, but nothing. Whatever it was had disappeared into the shrubs off in the distance. Crap, there really are hogs out here or something, huh? I thought to myself. Hoping there weren't more nearby, I reached the shop door and pulled it open with my free hand. My sketchbook was sitting on a small side table where I had left it that morning. I picked it up and tucked it under my arm before heading back outside. As I shut the door to the shop, a breeze picked up, and the cold wind bit at my exposed arms. It wasn't freezing by any means. This was Texas, after all, and it was still in the high 60s at night. But the sudden wind caught me by surprise, and I remember thinking it seemed colder than it should have been for this time of year. Out of curiosity, I aimed the flashlight over towards the area where I had heard the rustling before. Still nothing. With any luck, I had scared whatever it was off, and it wouldn't bother me as I made my way back to the camper. As I walked, the wind picked up, and I felt goosebumps form on my upper arms as the chilly air bit into me. Was there a cold front coming through? Mom and Dad hadn't mentioned anything like that. The wind blowing through the property started rustling the trees all around me, kicking up a dull roar from the wind whipping through the branches. My ears picked up on another noise that stuck out. Sounded almost like one of those wooden wind chimes you see in home decor stores, little plates of wood clacking together as they get jostled by the wind. 
I didn't remember seeing a wind chime during the day, but maybe I had just missed it? Mom did enjoy little yard decorations like that. I started walking a bit faster, suddenly feeling somewhat uneasy. Just walking back now, I hummed nervously. As I approached the outhouse only twenty or so feet from the camper, I noticed a weird shape on the ground, just off the side of the trail. As I looked at it in the flashlight beam, I realized what it was. Damn deer leg from before. It looked significantly more chewed and gnarled when I saw it at lunch. Georgie must have really gone to town on it. The skin was torn in places, and the pucked white bone was riddled with round teeth marks visible through the tears in the skin. I shrugged it off and kept walking, when suddenly that biting wind picked up again even louder than before this time. I hunkered down and hugged my arms to shield myself from the cold, and that's when I noticed the sound. A sound that had blended in seamlessly with the wind in the trees. A denser, thicker sound, accented with a series of clunks and shuffles. Something moving. Something alive. Something very, very close. I turned to look over my shoulder, expecting one of the wild hogs I had been warned about. It wasn't. The shape towered over me, a dark, mound-like silhouette that must have been fifteen feet in height, its edges just barely perceivable in the dark, lit by the moonlight above. The mound was raised a few feet off the ground, just barely supported by impossibly thin, wispy legs that were bent at odd angles. I couldn't make out how many there were in total. As the icy wind blew again, I realized what had been making this sound I'd heard. It wasn't a wind chime at all. The thick, hulking mass of the shape was a moving pile of bones and carcasses, held together by thin, leathery tendrils of shadow and muck. And it stood there, motionless except for the minute shifting of its assembled viscera on the wind. I was abruptly hit by the smell of it, an acidic, rotting stench that burned at the inside of my sinuses like a skunk had been left to rot in the sun. I felt my eyes water and my stomach churned, threatening to reject my dinner. As my eyes adjusted, I began to see more detail. Some of the bones that made up the mass were old, white and brittle picked clean by scavengers and clacking together as the wind blew through them. But most of the assembly of limbs and discarded animal body parts still had masses of flesh stuck to them, the last remnants of fur and skin of hunted animals hanging on, barely recognizable beneath various states of decay and flopping listlessly in the breeze. I recognized some of the shapes. When hiking with friends as a student, my friends and I once stumbled upon a nearly complete deer skeleton laying just off the trail. We had spent a fair amount of time looking at it, admiring the curve of the ribs, the knotted silhouette of the spine. It was almost beautiful in a way. There was nothing beautiful about the rotting collection of flesh and bones standing feet from me. I held my breath, frozen in place. A mouse in the path of a monster. I couldn't see any eyes, but I felt its gaze. It was watching me. Then, in a silent motion, almost imperceptible in the darkness, one of its spindly support legs curled outwards toward me. I flinched, fighting back the urge to scream. Should I run? Would it lash out if I made a break for the camper? The outhouse door was only a few feet away, but would that protect me against this shambling pile of bones and skin? I had to hold in a gasp of relief when its arm drifted off to the side, away from me. I heard a slight rustling as its shadowy tendril wrapped around something. A thin, gnarled stick. The deer leg. It wanted the deer leg. Was this thing what had been taking them? How many times had it come here? I saw its thin, spider-like appendage draw back into its mass, taking the chewed and discarded leg with it. The 
the deer leg disappeared inside of it, I heard a dense, slimy crack of the bone being shoved into place amongst the rest of the rotted pile. There was a beat of silence. I was still frozen in place, but feeling almost a twinge of relief. It had what it wanted. Maybe now it would turn back and leave? But no. The mass of bones and discarded flesh stood over me, looming. It wanted more. As the thing took its first shambling step towards me, I broke into a run. In only a few wide, panicked strides, I threw myself into the outhouse, slamming the door behind me and bracing it with my back, my feet propped up against the toilet seat. I flicked off the flashlight and held it to my chest, crouching huddled in the dark. My brain flashed to the scene in Jurassic Park where the lawyer hid from the T-Rex in a bathroom stall and ended up being the first to be eaten. God, what a place I'd pick to die in, I thought to myself. I heard the thing approaching, lumbering slowly forward, its tiny legs struggling to keep the rotted corpse pile upright in the wind. I could hear the thing snuffling around outside like an animal following a scent trail. Did it even have a nose or a mouth? Would it eat me, or just absorb me into the mound? The noise of it sniffing grew closer. It sounded less like an animal and more like short bursts of wind through a slimy, clogged-up sewage pipe, combined with the clatter of bones as it shifted its mass towards my hiding place. I held my breath, my hand clamped over my nose and mouth to keep even the slightest wheeze of air from escaping my lungs. My chest burned from the lack of oxygen, and I felt my head starting to swim, my fingers prickling as I tried to stay still. I felt my heartbeat pulsing hard in my neck as the wet sniffing sounds grew closer. It was right outside, disturbing the earth mere inches from the other side of the door I was pressed against. I couldn't see it, but I could feel its presence, the air pressure growing heavier as it drew closer. Again, the sound of the discarded and reclaimed limbs rustled and clacked together as the mass moved, accented by the flies I was now close enough to hear buzzing around it. Thump. It made contact with the door. Thump. It was pressing on the door now, trying to force its way inside. The door hinges moaned under the pressure, and I let out a pitiful yelp as I pushed back, fighting to keep the door closed. As if responding to my distress, the thing began pushing in more forcefully, and I felt the entire outhouse shake as the mound began to warp, the mass of bones and rot pressing in from all sides as it began to envelop the small wooden shack I hid inside. I heard the wooden structure creak and groan from the pressure of the mound forcing its way inside. God, what a horrible way to die. Suddenly, a sound. A loud, deep, rough sound not far from where I was. Barking. From inside the camper, the dogs had started barking. I panicked, thinking that the dogs were going to draw the thing over to them, but... As soon as the barking began, the pressure on the door and walls whisked away suddenly, as if fleeing from the sound. The door clunked against the frame as the opposing force disappeared, and I breathed in a gasp of cool autumn air, the feeling returning to my fingertips. Was it gone? I sat still, straining my ears to listen. Nothing. Just silence, not even the wind. I sat frozen on the floor of the outhouse for what felt like an eternity before I felt strong enough to stand. Shakily raised myself to my feet, leaning against the wall to steady myself. Holding my breath, I willed myself to peer out of the doorway. Nothing but the soft, warm glow of the porch light greeted me. The dogs had stopped barking, and I could hear the muffled sounds of my parents' voices from inside the camper. Turning my flashlight back on, I stepped outside and made a break for the camper door. There you are, Mom greeted me as I stumbled inside. What took you so long? I stood in the doorway, my knees still shaking. I tried to speak, but my voice caught in my throat. I wanted to tell them what I had seen, what happened, but I couldn't force the words out. 
They lodged themselves in my neck, holding tight. What had I seen again? It was just there. I thought there was something. Something big. But... A uh, hog. Big one. I stuttered, catching my breath. Are you okay? Mom asked, concerned, looking over me for signs of injury. Yeah, I'm fine. It just, uh, surprised me. The dog's barking scared it off. I set the flashlight down on its shelf and gingerly sat at the end of the couch. Both dogs came over to me snuggling around my legs, and I patted their shoulders as I knelt down to take off my boots. The rest of the night passed uneventfully. I hugged the dogs close to me as I laid on the couch, their weight providing a bristly security blanket of sorts. The action movie continued on the TV. I didn't really pay attention to it. My sketchbook lay next to me, unused. My mind was elsewhere, buzzing with so many thoughts it simply blended into static. Something had been outside, but it hadn't been a hog, right? It was bigger than that. Noisier, right? Beside me, the dogs were calm, nearly asleep. They say a dog's senses are ten times more effective than a human's. If whatever it was came back, they'd scare it off again. Right? The next morning, I stepped outside as the dogs trotted off for their morning patrol. I watched them waddle into the distance past the shop, and a voice sounded from behind me. Told you. Told me what? I asked as Dad walked over from the other side of the camper. Trotter's gone. Something must have come and carried it off last night. Oh, Yes, so. I looked over the ground in the area. No sign of animal tracks, no damage to the outhouse, no sign of the something I had seen the night before. But the unease lingered in the pit of my stomach. A breeze whispered through the trees, and I thought I heard the sound of a wind chime out in the field. I turned to my dad. So, hey, when did you say you were getting that fence built? <laughs> 